This meeting is being recorded. My name is uh, Commissioner Greg Hooksma, Chair of the Gig Harbor Planning Commission. It's Thursday, April 28th, and I am calling our meeting to order. First order of business is roll call. Commissioner Greiner. Here. Commissioner Krozik. Here. Commissioner Brown. Here. Commissioner Soltis. He's on mute, but I know I saw his face Here. earlier. There he is. And uh, Commissioner Bennett is excused this evening. And I don't see Commissioner Bradbury. If you'll note when he joins the meeting, please, Michelle. Of course. Thank you. So first item on the agenda this evening is to approve the minutes from our last meeting. If there are any corrections or discussion on those minutes? Let me know. Otherwise, I am willing to entertain a motion. So moved. There's a motion I assume you mean to accept the minutes? Yes. Do I hear a second? Second. We have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Motion passes unanimously. OK. <clears throat> so uh, welcome, everybody. The, the only item on our agenda this evening is another discussion of the short-term rental ordinance. And I really appreciate everyone's um, willingness to have an extra meeting uh, again this month in the interest of keeping this process moving along on behalf of the citizens of Gig Harbor and particularly the folks that are interested in getting um, the uh, emergency moratorium lifted. And um, so I, I, it's been a nice opportunity this past week to, to look back over. I think uh, one of the things I want you all to be keeping in mind today is uh, the law of unintended consequences, making sure that all the decisions that we have made um, still make sense to you today after you've had a, a week to uh, think about them. And then uh, after we get finished going through the table um, that we've been um, plotting through, I want to make sure that everybody has an opportunity at the end of that to bring up any issues that they think still have yet to be covered or perhaps were missed in the table. So with that, I will hand it over to you, Carl. All right, thank you, Chair. Um, and I did want to just note um, for, for the members of the public that are uh, viewing the uh, meeting this evening, the, um, we realized that the table that we had put out um, with the agenda last week did not have the updates that we made to the table at the meeting last week. So just so there's no confusion for anybody who may not have been here um, at the meeting last week, this, the table we'll be looking at today uh, does does include um, many of the decisions that were uh, that the planning commission had made last week, um, and uh, that is um, available to anyone who would would like to see a copy of it after the meeting um, and prior to uh, next week. So, chair, I just wanted to make that get that on the record and let everybody know that we we had made a mistake there. Um, all right, let me share my screen. Which one is it? There we go. Zoom webinar. <laughs> Are you guys seeing this table? See my cursor here? Yes. Yeah. Okay, great. Okay, so where we left off last week um, was actually we left off on number 11. Uh, item number 11, maximum number of tenants uh, an, ST, an STR may house. And that the discussion kind of morphed into parking. We sort of morphed it into number 15 and we ended up with this um, final result here of zero additional parking stalls required. Um, but we never really came back and sort of closed the loop on item number 11. And I guess, I don't, I don't know if that was because we sort of decided at the time that there was no, no reason um, to impose any kind of restriction on the number of tenants, um, or if we 
just kind of got off track and started talking about parking. And I don't, I, I apologize that I don't recall exactly how that conversation went. So I think we, we start here um, with maximum number of tenants an STR may house um, and make a, make a determination on that. So I'll stop sharing and turn it back over to you, Chair. Okay, thanks. Okay, discussion. Commissioner Grino. Uh, I, in reading through all the different things we've read through over all this time, I really like the two people per bedroom um, requirement for maximum number of tenants. Um, and that I think that's separate from permanent residents. I mean, Carl has a note in here about permanent residents and I, I think, well, I'm not sure how we could do that. So I think for short-term rental people, it should be two people per better. So there you go. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Krawczyk. Yeah, uh, Shannon, did did you uh, you intend to also include a child with that? I didn't think about that, <laughs> but I think it would have to be a child under a certain age if you did stipulate it that way would be my feeling. But I'm open to hear what other people think. So maybe like a child uh, seven or under? Maybe three and under, <laughs> I don't know. Well, I, I think that um, what the uh, short-term alliance had suggested was two adults per bedroom and two children without any age specification. Um, and, <clears throat> you know, I. I am comfortable with that. Um, I think that you know folks will travel with with their uh, teenage children. Um, I, I think again, that's getting into a a um, well-intentioned thing that would be nigh on impossible to enforce, and it, it would be kind of self-regulated by by a family. Um, as I've mentioned, I own a, I own a, it's not a, a, a very small hotel room that's basically, you know, run under a management team in Telluride, Colorado. And there's actually a, a, a double bed and a single bed in there. Um, you, you know, so a, a mom and dad and their 16 year old child could, um, stay in that room and they do that all the time. So I don't see a need. Um, for an age restriction on there. And I can also tell you from my personal experience of traveling with two kids um, in some places where, you know, we were in, didn't have another choice. We all stayed, all four of us stayed together in, in one bedroom. <laughs> so we've had some um, pretty interesting and, and uh, very nice family time together. But anyway, I, I don't see a need for an age restriction. I like what the Alliance has suggested, two adults, two kids per rented room. Yeah, I, I like that too. And I think it's typical of what I've seen in other uh, regulations. I can live with that. So, um, I'm a kind of concerned about the, the, how you separate the people, the owners that are actually staying there and the rooms that are rented. So say you had a four bedroom house, the owners are staying in one of the rooms, I presume, then they'd have three bedrooms to, to rent basically. And so you could put two people in each of those three bedrooms, that's a total of six adults plus the owners. Is that the way we should be looking at this? I think the number of bedrooms available to rent should be limited to two. That once again is typical of what uh, most other jurisdictions have. Uh, have. 
to to when they're not renting out the whole house right so during that yeah. outside of that 90 day period well i i guess um you know again the other side of that coin is um someone at some point in their their life ends up with a four bedroom house and they're living alone they've lost their spouse um they want to rent do short-term rentals to three single people. <clears throat> you know, the folks have mentioned the visiting, you know, nurses that that uh, some of the short-term rentals have serviced. Um, yeah. You know, any, I can imagine any scenario where, um, you know, it would be reasonable to do that and, and wouldn't necessarily be an imposition on the neighborhood. Three bedrooms is at least three cars. Two bedrooms is... <laughs> Probably not more than two cars. Doesn't the parking play into this? I mean, if, if you have, you can't, theoretically, you shouldn't be able to rent more rooms than you have the, the parking spaces available for them, mm -hmm. I think. Is that the way that could play in together? I mean, if you don't have three parking spaces, you can't rent three rooms. Well, and, and that gets back to the answer to Carl's question, because if what I remembered, I know we're all tired, but what I remember at the end of the last meeting was exactly that, that we, the last thing we agreed to is that the, the STRs have to provide off street parking for all of their guests. And so that becomes a, uh, a self regulating requirement as well that you have just, you know, pointed out, uh, Bob. Am I remembering that right? I think we got bogged down and we didn't have enough caffeine to finish the conversation. <laughs> Greg, that was my understanding was that the parking was the a limiting factor there and that we had to have uh, parking for all guests. So, so, so we're saying that we need to have parking available for the number of of rooms that would be rented or yeah it's 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 hard because you know if we're talking about renting out the whole house then nothing nothing has changed necessarily from a single family residential use to you know even though they might have more people staying there than a regular than a family might have the house is still really essentially being used as a single family residential home in that sense for those, you know, let's say 29 days if somebody rented it out for the maximum period for a short term rental. And then, you know, they, and they're required to have the two, um, two parking stalls for a single family home. Our lodging level one right now, which is essentially our bed and breakfast requires uh, one, one and a quarter spaces for each room rented in addition to those two spaces. So that's our current, essentially that's our current requirement and that's what we've been going with for anybody coming in for a short-term rental prior to imposing the moratorium. So if we leave it as just parking that they need to have parking available for the number of tenants they're going to rent to, then it there's that, you know, I think we're going to end up with a lot of gray area there and staff is going to have to kind of try and figure that out then. And if we get complaints, then we're going to have to try and sort out how many people they've had there. You know, it just becomes an unenforceable, I think. So I think it's either in my mind, it's either a, we're not going to impose any additional parking spaces. We're not going to require any additional parking spaces, or we're going to require just a certain number, a hard, a hard and fast number. I, I think that's a, a, a better way to go in my, in, in my opinion. Give me an example, Carl, if, uh, of that hard number. Say you had uh, two bedrooms for rent um, does that mean they'd have to have two spaces additional to the two for the owner? Right now, we would say 
two and a half spaces, right? We would, and then Jeremy, we round that up or down in our current code. It is rounded up. Rounded up. Situations. So in, yeah, so, so it'd be three. So in that scenario, it would be three, the way we currently have our code written. Um, or we could say just one space per room, and which I think is where Commissioner Brown was kind of going with it. Typically, oh, think, sorry, Commissioner Crossley. Yeah, I, I think the off street parking is uh, requirement is essential and it doesn't really make too much difference to me whether we say it's two spaces for the entire unit or one space or one or quarter spaces per room. I just think we need to have some sort of requirement there. Otherwise, the off street parking is going to start causing problems for the neighborhood. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I think in a congested area, you're not going to need to worry about enforcement because the neighbors will let you know um, if those parking codes are being violated. And, it, and, and that's why I'm comfortable with saying uh, off-street off parking required for all guests. You know, if it's your next door neighbor, you're going to see them trekking in and out of there, and it's going to be obvious um, what's going on. Mm -hmm. With that, regard to the number of bedrooms, uh, that limitation, I, I, I don't see why we should be more liberal than other jurisdictions. And that's why I feel that uh, two is uh, the right number. Hey, Tom, which jurisdictions, can you give me a specific on that? Or do you, do you remember at all? Something in Washington? Yeah, uh, gosh, I looked at five or six. There only there were half half a dozen or so cities in Washington that had legislation for short term rentals, and it seems to me I, I made up a table as a matter of fact that they all had a limitation of two bedrooms per residence, uh, and and that was it for for hosted rentals. How do the other, how do you, uh, Commissioner Griner, how do you feel about that number restricting it to two? Sorry, I, I got kind of confused if we were still talking people or if we're par talking parking there. Oh, uh, well, now we're talking, uh, <laughs> it bounced back to, or do we want to put a limit on the total number of rooms that uh, a person that's operating an owner-occupied SDR is allowed to rent out. Okay. Um, uh, Thomas suggested a maximum of two. I'm, I'm fairly, I'm good with that. I, I mean, I understand the other scenarios, but I, that's fine with me. How about you, Bob? I, I, I think if there's precedent. Two is fine, and then I think the idea is then everybody has all those two. Whoever's in those bedrooms has to park on site. There's no off-site parking for them. Right. I think that's a good, uh, fair middle of the road approach. So, the, so now that I'm thinking about it, so is that only with an owner-occupied unit as opposed to? a whole house rental? I mean, are we differentiating those two things? Well, that's a good point. Because if you rent a whole house, I mean, you know, lots of times most houses have three bedrooms and a master or something like that. So, you know, then, then two would not be probably appropriate for a whole house rental. And now we're down the slippery slope of, you know, do we want to differentiate those things or what? But I, I think that they're almost two separate animals. Yeah. So we're, we've decided, and maybe I'm not following, but I, we've decided that short term rentals will be owner occupied only. And, and the whole house will only be rented uh, for 90 days total 
out of the year. And the rest of the time, the owner must live on the premises as well. So during the, during the whole, when the whole house is rented out during those 90 days, I think we're, we're saying, yeah, the whole house, right, we're, I don't think we're limiting the number of rooms at that point. We're only limiting the number of rooms when the owner, for the, for the other nine months out of the year. Yes, yes. Right. So I think what, yeah, so I think you're right, Commissioner Grina, we, we, do, we do have to kind of separate those two in, so, in, in a certain, in, a, in some way, you know, between the 90 days and, the, and when it's more effectively really a bed and breakfast, I guess, for, you know, it's, 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 it's acting more like a bed and breakfast um, those other nine months. Mm -hmm. And I know, you know, I was just flipping through my um, memo that I had sent, put out on January 27th that looked at a few cities um, to see if any of those had any, anything in them about the number of rooms. Bellevue, they had boarding houses or bed and breakfasts that may accommodate a maximum of two rooms for rental and a maximum of two lodgers or renters. Um, single family home with a boarding house or bed and breakfast must accommodate only a single family in total. So they are limiting it to just one family if it's, a, if it's the full house being rented out. Uh, let's see, and then Spokane, I don't think had anything relative to that. Walla Walla, have you got Walla Walla on the list? Yeah, I do. Um, I'll get to that one. And then Tacoma requires city business license unless renting three or more individual rooms. And then that requires a different license. They call that a transient accommodation license. Uh, and sometimes that's depending on the zone, whether it needs a conditional use permit. Walla Walla. It's not allowed, local contact, require a uh, listing number, classify short-term rentals. I don't see anything about number of rooms in Walla Walla. At least, and you know, these are just my notes that I kind of pulled together, but I think I was trying to capture those, though, you know, I was trying to capture those sorts of provisions in these summaries. So, and I also don't see anything in Olympia relative to that. Jeremy, you have anything different? Uh, same thing from what I could see, most of the ones that uh, have a restriction on rooms were codes that were adapted from traditional bed and breakfasts. Right. Uh, rather than one specifically for short term rentals. Carl, I like the definition of Bellingham, which says that if you're going to rent the whole house, it's a single uh, immediate family. But I would expand that definition a little bit to include uh, adult children and grandchildren. Well, that, that would concern me because why not, well, first of all, they have spouses that may not, that aren't blood relatives, but <clears throat> why would we want to prevent two families from renting a whole house and going to Gig Harbor? I, I don't know that there's a good reason to do that. Well, then how do you prevent two families from becoming three families or four families in a larger house? I guess you you just have to have a limitation, like not more than eight guests total or something like that. I mean, it, that's the only way I can think of to address it. And, and, and that's really what we care about, isn't it? Yeah, okay. Well, that would be another approach and I think that could work.
Well, if you're two adults per bedroom, that won't that limit it? I mean, mm -hmm. you'd only have as many couples as you have bedrooms, and there'd only be two. Yes. So that, by having that in place, that solves that problem, I would think. And and I think you know part part of the part of this discussion too. You know, we have to keep in mind that we are talking about a single family residential home. This really doesn't change the occupancy type. You know, I spoke with the building official about this. They're still, they're not reviewing these as, you know, they won't review a commercial or a, a short-term rental as a commercial um, uh, use. They're gonna be looking at it at, as a residential occupancy. So it, it does not change the occupancy for someone to have a short-term rental there. And really for them, for the, for the building codes, it really comes down to exiting, um, you know, how many, how many exits are in the house? Can they get people out of the house safely? And how many bathrooms are in the house? And yeah. Can they service the number of people who are going to be in there? So if you have 15 bedrooms, then you're going to have to have, you know, however many toilets and, and, and showers that would, that would accommodate that number of people. Yeah. So, you know, some of this stuff is also, um, some of this stuff would also be dealt with through codes that are already in place. So, so you're talking is, I guess that one of the questions that I would have is there an, is, a, is there a maximum number of, um, or minimum number of square feet per person that is allowed in, in any given building so that you couldn't pack a whole bunch of, um, you know, teenage summer workers, right? You know, you get six or eight of them sharing, uh, you know, a single house. I mean, my son is up at UW in a not very big house that's carved up into nine bedrooms. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I have lived in one of those myself. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, it's a good, that's a good question. You know, I asked the building official this and, you know, from their standpoint, I mean, if they were looking at it from that from that through that lens, 200 square feet um, per person came off, you know, came off the top of his head. That's again, it it really comes the occupancy load comes down more to can we get people out of here safely, and can the house service that number of people that are going to be living there, and right. and so that does kind of look at bedrooms. Um, you know, the number of bedrooms that you're proposing um, for a house. I mean, you can have more bathrooms, I suppose, than bedrooms, but you really can't have more bedrooms than, than bathrooms needed. You have operable uh, windows for, for egress and, um, you know, back door, front door, um, the widths of doorways, you know, those sorts of things. That, that's all handled by the building code. And, and again, because they need a business license for this type of use, um, there would be, you know, the, build, the building fire marshal would be making an inspection on the, on the home right. to ensure that it's safe. So, you know, I, I don't know. I, I don't know if that helps or if that confuses things, but maybe, maybe it's easy, easier to defer some of this to some of the codes that are already in place. Yeah, well, I think I think that let's let's cut to the the bottom line question, and that is, um, do we want to restrict the total number of bedrooms that people can rent out during the owner occupied portion, the hosted time in their house? And Thomas suggested a max of two. Shannon said she was comfortable with that. Uh, John and Bob, how do you feel about that number? I'm comfortable with two. I'm okay with that. Okay. All right. There you have it. Two. Right. Not more than two. Okay. And then during the non-hosted portion, um, I think it gets back to what you were just talking about. There's already codes in place. 
for those that maximum of 90 days where you know they might be renting it out to renting uh, out the whole home. To play. And then the third part is there must be a sufficient parking to accommodate all guests on, on site. Something along that lines, right? Yeah, off, off street, off street on site parking for to accommodate all guests. And, and, and the other the other point really related to that is I've seen most ordinances in the you know, state that garage spaces are included. So most residences have two garage spaces plus a couple of other spaces. Right. And as and as the Alliance has pointed out, you know, that that includes the tandem parking, you know, the sort of stacked parking. And, and it, to me, it doesn't, you don't even really have to describe it because, you know, however they can do it within the, the confines of the other city's regulations and codes and such, then, you know, however they do it, they do it. Yeah. And Carl, you can keep them off the uh, parking on the yard, yard, right? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Well, in theory, in theory, we can keep them from doing that. Yes. Um, I wanted to bring up one point and hopefully this doesn't confuse things too much, but so for our current lodging level one, that means a single, it's defined as a single family residence, which provides overnight lodging for guests and may provide meals for overnight guests, not to exceed five guest rooms. Now that, that, that definition was written for, you know, bed, bed and breakfasts and that was before we had, you know, any kind of Airbnb um, type of use that we were talking about. I'm just thinking in the future here uh, that if we go with this type of a provision, and I guess part of it becomes a question of whether or not you know, we're discerning any kind of difference between when any kind of difference between an Airbnb and a bed and breakfast. A lot of bed and breakfasts now are advertising on these Airbnb platforms and VRBO platforms and things. And there's really starting to become very little difference between the two. Hmm. Um, so, you know, I guess, I guess a question comes up for me in that during that 90 days, how are we going to determine whether somebody is a lodging level one or whether they're in a short-term rental? Because if I'm, if I'm homeowner, A, if I'm the homeowner and I'm in that situation and I'm looking at the lodging level one definition, I'm going to go with five guest rooms if I can, whereas a short-term rental is saying I can only have two. That's something I guess that needs to be worked out in this. And, and you know, the short-term rental ordinance, maybe it replaces lodging level one altogether. And yeah, I was gonna ask, why do we think we need lodging level one? Well, I don't think that we do. I, the only thing that gives me pause, Commissioner Brown, I guess, is that because we've said in there that it's going to be five guest rooms for these lodging level ones, and we've, we've been having a hard time finding any kind of state or any kind of definition for, um, for bed and breakfasts. And we just, I guess we just, I guess I, I guess that's something I need to t speak with the attorney about and make sure that we're not um, getting ourselves hogtied over that in some manner, because I, you know, I don't, if there is, if there is some definition out there that would allow for five, five guest rooms, for a bed and breakfast, then we, you know, then we could be creating a problem for ourselves if we were to eliminate that use altogether. So I'm not kind of thinking, thinking out loud a little bit. Uh, the the dichotomy between bed and breakfast and short term rental is, is a critical one to define. I, I've seen that as an issue from the beginning. Yeah. Well, I, I so. I kind of envision that, for example, the waterfront inn. I I don't. 
uh, you know, I, it's functioning as an inn. I mean, it has seven rooms and um, and it's essentially purpose built, you know, to that. They carved this small house up into seven small rooms to maximize the profit from it. And it's, it's functioning as an inn. And, and so I don't, I don't, I see that different than, yeah. than, than what we're talking about. I also, yes. the part, the parsonage has functioned for a long time as a bed and breakfast. And I see that different than what we're talking about. I would see, and I would see going in the future that both of those places would continue to function, you know, the way that they currently are, um, uh, being called something other than an STR that's burdened by this ordinance or um, maybe burdened isn't the right word, but affected. Uh, as you know, a lot of these small inns uh, known as boutiques uh, overlap with bed and breakfast as well. They, they can be very small, five, six, seven rooms is all they have. And, and they will also market themselves uh, along the lines of the bed and breakfast, very much blurring those lines. But the key in our code is that it has to be it has to be able to meet the definition of a single family residence to be a lodging level one. So in order to meet that, to in order to be a, a bed and breakfast, and in fact, it'll be the same thing for our short term rental ordinance, it has to meet that definition of a single family residence as well. So I don't know how the in fits into that definition or the parsonage. I'm not sure about that. If they even would meet those definitions. Well, I know the parsonage that is owner occupied and, and um, Mary lives there and has run that business, you know, for, I, I don't know how many years, but mm. a, a pretty long time already. And, and I, you know, she, I haven't stayed there, but, um, it seems to be the classic what you would expect, you know, uh, a beautiful old parsonage, you, you know, one of the first ministers, you know, lived there, nice gardens, well tended, takes nice, good care of her guests, gets great reviews, gives them breakfast, you know, a classic bed and breakfast, breakfast experience. Yep. Yeah, we, I, you know, and that I think that's important that we we don't want to we don't want to we don't want to we don't want to uh, create something that essentially makes those uses obsolete that right. that are operating now as you know a, that's something that's it's working it's beneficial it meet and and if it meets the certain the, the current definitions I just want to be careful that we don't create something that eliminates those altogether if you know if, if unless we don't want to support those anymore within the code well aren't aren't uh, b b and b's as you've just described them uh simply uh strs that have more than two two bedrooms available essentially i think that's that's the difference. So if, if someone wanted to uh, open up a B and B and they came to the city and said, "I want a license," or "What do I need to do?" He'd say, "Well, how many how many rooms do you want to rent?" And they'd say, uh, three, four, five, whatever." Say, "Okay, well, that's not an STR. That's a B and B, uh, and it's a different set of uh, requirements." Okay, right. Kind of answers itself, I think. I I think so. Yeah, I think so. No. I think that's a very elegant solution. Not to mention, I, I, I think it should go through a much more detailed and complex permitting process so that because that that type of facility has a, a much greater impact on the neighborhood. Yeah. OK. That answers it for me. Thank you. 
Okay. Like maybe uh, these are conditional then, right? Uh, in some zones, but not in not in all zones. Some some zones they're permitted, and some they're conditional uses. Do I understand the definition to be three or four bedrooms? Anything more than that is, is uh, not part of this definition. Yeah, we did that earlier, Larry. Okay. Uh, I, I would add, though, uh, I apologize for being late, and I'm going to apologize for having to, to bow out a little bit early. I, I've had a change in plans uh, thrust upon me since uh, I said I would be available for this night. So I, I will participate for a little while longer, and, and then I will have to bow out. Okay, Carl, let's move along. Okay, so I'm just making a note here. So two, two bedrooms during the hosted period. And did we determine a maximum number of tenants or we decided to, I, I'm sorry if I missed that. Two, two adults and two kids per bedroom, I think. And that's during all periods. That's that's during both hosted and unhosted. Right. So as long as you say two two adults, two kids per bedroom per per rented room. Is that right? Right. That yeah, yeah that's the way to to do it right, I think. Yeah, that's a that's a good point, Shannon. <clears throat> Uh, and then parking must be provided off street. Off street parking must be provided. Is that, do I have that right? I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, number twelve. Minimum rental period. Minimum periods of uh, two nights and four nights were mentioned uh, by the planning commission previously. Uh, obviously, our maximum for short-term rental would be twenty-nine days. Um, are we still wanting to impose some sort of mental minimum rental period? I think the two nights is reasonable. Well, I, I don't think we can do that without appearing to create a hostile requirement. And here's why. Uh, the STR down the road outside of the city limits will accept a one night reservation and be happy with it. And I think we'll run into a lot of opposition uh, if, if we try to impose a, a two-night or, or greater uh, minimum. Uh, and, 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 I, and I think it's just kind of a, uh, I don't know, an anti-establishment, uh, uh, anti-business uh, requirement myself. I frequently rent these places for one night. And... Uh, I don't really see any problem with that. I... I, I agree. I don't see any any benefit added by having a minimum rental period. Well, the reason that I was suggesting two nights is that would just limit the amount of in and out traffic that was occurring. Yeah. Uh, as a result of just a lot of one night stays. On the other hand, there may not be that many just one night stays. Most may be multiple night stays. I guess it's not something I feel really strongly about, but that was the re that was my reasoning. 
Yeah, I understand that, but I tend to agree with Tom. And and even uh, although the the alliance suggested a two nights stay, I, I don't agree with their logic about about why that that those people for the most part are just passing through and they don't contribute a lot to the gig harbor gig harbor economy and they're not really interested in gig harbor. But um, again, having said that, if if they come in, you know, they've had a long day. It's time to pull over and they want to stay and there's lots of people like apparently Tom and I that always prefer a, a, an Airbnb uh, when we travel um, and and so they pull in they're not loud they go downtown they dine at a restaurant they get up they grab you know breakfast at devoted kiss cafe I you know I think that's I don't see any reason either to to put that restriction in but I don't um, again it gets back to if it's if someone was and someone is living there, they're gonna and they're still working. They're going in and out in and out of their house every morning. And if they both work, there's two cars going in and out. And if they have kids, you know, there's lots of trips in and out. So I, I appreciate your point, John, but I, I just don't see that as uh, enough of a change um, in use or enough of a disruption to to put a restriction on on two night minimum. might also add that I think it would be, again, pretty difficult to enforce. I'll go with uh, Greg and Tom on this one, John, sorry. No, that, that's, that's okay, because uh, Carl raises a very good point, the difficulty of enforcement, so I'm fine with no minimum. Yeah, and as I said earlier, likewise. So I have a note here on this one. Did we want to cap the non-hosted rentals to 90 days per year? Yes. I thought Did we, we already do that. do that somewhere else? I just wrote a note over here. So. Yeah. yeah. I'll, uh, here, I can show you, Commissioner Greiner. Um, one sec here. And so I just lined oh, there out. There it is. Yeah, I lined out number 12 and then, yeah, we picked up 90 days per year unhosted. I'm number five, okay. Number five, yep. I'm fine with that. Okay, so I took out number 12. Uh, number 13, will quiet hours be required? And if so, what are those hours? It seems like most of the ordinances that we reviewed had some sort of mention of quiet hours. Some I think had actual hours written. Some just kind of had it in the good neighbor policy that it would, you know, that there would be reasonable hours. But I think a lot of a lot of the ordinances do point to some sort of um, uh, quiet hours. Magnifier reader. Zoom level eight. Ten to a port sixteen. I can zoom this in a bit too if that's too small. It is kind of small, isn't it? I'm sorry. Maybe that's better. Uh, I think me... 10 to 8 is fine, Carl. I agree. I concur. That's good. Sounds oh. like consensus. <laughs> All right. Sounds good. All right. Okay, so we'll move. Move on, number 14. Will there be a penalty associated with each violation of the standards set forth in the short-term rental section of the code? Um, we do have some, uh, we already have some enforcement mechanisms available to us um, in Title 17. Uh, that then leads to Title 19. We have some enforcement there. And we also have uh, some enforcement of our business license and regulations. Um, I know that there was some discussion in the past about the number of violations maybe lead to uh, you know, a re revocation of that um of the permit and that's something we could look at 
Um, and, you know, I think there was also some discussion about maybe sort of a, a scaling up of penalties for first, second, third violations. Um, let me stop, I'll stop sharing this. And I can tell you in 501 with our business licenses, We have some, we have quite a bit of language in here actually about it, um, about revocation of business licenses. Uh, in addition to other penalties provided, any business license issued under the provisions of the chapter may be revoked or suspended should any of the following conditions apply. And we have a list of conditions. Um, one of those being the place of business does not conform to city ordinance. The license is being used for a purpose different than that from which it was issued. Um, the licenses, the licensee's continued conduct of the business for which the license was issued has or will result in danger to public health, safety, or welfare, or the violation of any federal or state law or any ordinance or regulation of the city. Uh, and then there's a, there's a couple others. I think those are the most pertinent though. Would that cover noise problems, Carl, any of those words? Well, I think it would because we do have a noise, we do have a noise ordinance, although it doesn't have a lot of teeth. Um, noise is one of those really difficult ones to enforce upon, but um we also have in this ordinance, we're putting in quiet hours. We may, you know, when, when we go to draft this ordinance, we'll probably want to either, um, we, we, we kind of have to provide some definition around that, I think, um, and likely pointing to our, what we have in the code for noise ordinance currently um, to ensure that they're not violating that and and so I think that this suspension or revocation procedure would include um, it includes all city ordinances so it would include the short term ordinance it would also include that noise ordinance so it would, it would capture that it's just again it's one of those kind of difficult things to for local jurisdictions to enforce. Uh, I, I can certainly see that and, and Carl I would kind of vote for what you're uh, saying here is that. This, this portion of the ordinance should reflect uh, other already prior established codes and ordinances that are, are uh, reflected in, in the table that you put forth, 17 and the others. Well, I get the sense, Larry, that some of the citizens don't feel quite that comfort, comforted by the code that's out there because we heard some comments that there were some problems and I don't think Carl's got records of any of these problems coming to the city, which kind of uh, strikes me as odd if, if people were upset about it, that they just kind of internalized it and didn't call anybody. So I don't know if our city, our systems are fully functional. And I certainly don't know if they called the police because it sounds like the police never got every, every, any complaints either. Well, that, that's the bottom line. If, if somebody is not willing to bring such an issue to an authority that can address it, then, then there's nothing the city can do. True. If they didn't, and then shame on them. If they did and it got lost in the records, shame on us. So I don't know right. where, the, where the true story is. And maybe, Carl, you've got better intel on it. Uh, I can address it a little bit. I know, you know, so noise is is something that's going to be you know they're going to call the non-emergency police line you know for a for a noise complaint, and officers will respond to those complaints, but they're not likely to. The reason we don't have record of it is because they're looking at that as a single family residence, or maybe it's in a an apartment building, but they're they're not looking at it as a short term rental necessarily. 
And generally speaking, people who are staying there, if the police did show up, even if they tell the police that it's a short-term rental, I doubt that that's likely to make it into the, into the record as it stands today. Now that might be something that we change as we, you know, once we have this, um, this use in place, and that might be something we can work with the, the police, the police department on to ensure that we're, if, if they, if they know that it's a short-term rental, that that is put into their report so that we have some records of those, but that's likely the case that, that there have been complaints, police, respond to noise complaints all the time, but I just don't think that, you know, it's just, it's just how they're reporting it is, is different than what we, maybe what we need in this instance. So, so what are some of the, um, the financial penalties that are already written into the code? I mean, are they, are they significant or are they a hundred bucks? They are, um, so the monetary civil penalties for violations of this code shall be as follows, unless at a different amount slash penalty is specifically provided elsewhere in the code for the violation. The amount of civil penalty per each violation for each day in violation shall be $100. At the time a civil penalty is issued, calculation of the amount assessed shall be based no, uh, shall be based on no more than the number of past days during which the violation remained uncorrected since the service of the notice of violation. So we have to get to a notice of violation first. And then if it's not corrected from that point of notice of violation, and, and in our notice of violation, we give them a certain period of time to correct that. If they haven't, if they, if they haven't um, provided the correction within that period of time, then we can start assessing this one hundred dollars per day. Yeah. So, in other words, it's essentially unenforceable. It doesn't work great for things like this that are kind of happening in the moment. You know, that's really for something like yeah, I drove a bulldozer into the wetland. That's you know, that's a little bit more you know something like this that kind of happens a little more slowly. This is happening a little bit faster, so. Um, but it, it appears that we do have the latitude to in, to put in um, some penalties based on the first provision that I read there. I'll also just say that um, the city council is interested, and I know that they have a study session coming up to discuss code enforcement and uh, our civil penalty process, because there's I think there's been, um, we're getting bigger, you know, and the way we've been doing code enforcement is probably not adequate for how quickly the city has grown. And so I think they're gonna be looking at that um, and figuring out how maybe another way or a better way or more proactive enforcement. Um, Commissioner Greinick, you have your hand up. I'll like Commissioner Hooksma has stepped away for a moment. Uh so I had written down based on a number of different things that I read, and one of them was the, the different California cities that they had, you know, a $1,500 penalty after the first offense. And that even included operating without, you know, meeting any of the requirements. And then it was five, and after that, anything after the first time was $5,000 per I mean, that's pretty tough, but but I think it's gotta have teeth to make it work. So I had written that down. I think at one point Greg had mentioned that as well. I might not be in the right context, Greg, but anyhow, yeah. that's it a note a, I had made. Yeah, it was the same context. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Soltis. Well, I think, um, I'm interested in the business license. Uh, there were some um, some language Carl cited earlier about the business license. I, I think, and, and the numbers that, that Shanna's kind of mentioning is for when they're operating without a license or doing something that's really outside the normal routine of business. Um, and I think those are should, should certainly be heavy. Um, but I think there's two different kinds of things. There's also the thing, well, there's a noisy party and they get a police call and it gets into the system, uh, that seems like a, a little bit 
you know, it's not good, but it's not as bad as trying to you know run a business without having the proper licenses. So I would think, and just as for a thought here, is that maybe we've got a couple of different tiers. If they've got extra cars parked at the house for one night and it, uh, it got to be a problem with neighbors, that's relatively small. Maybe that's a smaller issue or a fine. But if it's something where they're doing bad business practices that they shouldn't be doing, like running a, a place without having a license, that should be a lot more um, substantial in my, in my humble opinion, at least. All right. Yeah, thanks for pointing out that difference. Other thoughts? Yeah, I, I would I would agree with your point, Bob. Um, and and when I've talked about severe and rapidly escalating penalties in the past meetings, it's it's been with respect to you know what Shannon is pointing out and. Uh, um, we got to get these, all these underground Airbnbs, you know, on the up and up and on the level. And, and to, if there is not a severe financial penalty for operating or trying to operate underground, then people will continue to do it. And, and, um, and I liked the numbers that that one city set, you know, 1500 bucks the first time and $5,000 the second time, you know, that's going to, you know, people are going to, they're going to get their applications. in if, if that's the thing, and it is quite easy to track because they have got to advertise somewhere. And we're, we have put in the requirement that they have to advertise to a third party platform. Um, and there's a reason for that as well, because the city needs to collect their, their, fair share of lodging taxes. Um, it's not fair that Airbnbs can operate and not pay a lodging tax when a hotel room, you know, has to. Um, and so, you know, that's a, another type of instance that I would see where, um, it, you know, again, you're, you're trying to operate underneath the requirements of the ordinance. But I do agree with Bob's, you know, point that a, a single instance of too many cars parked you know, shouldn't, shouldn't trigger a $1,500 penalty. Um, but, but there shouldn't be too many repeat violations along those lines where you start having substantial, you know, financial penalties as well, as far as I'm concerned. So that gives the public um, the reassurance that the city means business in, in keeping this whole thing under control. And um, you know, the notion that people aren't going to continue to buy up properties, um, the data doesn't support that. Um, there, you know, the, again, that the waterfront end was just purchased for $3 million. It's, it's operating exclusively as a, a seven, um, room in, uh, a property down on the spit, um, even though it's not in the city, but it's just as an example, um, that property was purchased for $1.7 million. It's, it's operating exclusively as a non-owner occupied Airbnb. Um, <clears throat> there, and so you can go down the list, the property up on Ross Avenue was purchased for $950,000. Um, it was remodeled, so additional you know, money was put into it and it's operating exclusively as a non-owner occupied Airbnb. So, um, this is happening and it will continue to happen because we we've, we've seen it all over the country and Geek Harbor is a very desirable place. So the point of all that is people got to play by the rules. And the only way we can be sure that they do that is a have an, an effective enforcement. We right now we have a part time um, city employee or maybe he's full time, but but only part of his job, part of his FTE is committed to enforcement of all every single code in the entire city um so i think that's why the city council is going to have this discussion because it needs to be had but um we we you know to use somebody's term we need to put some teeth behind it greg i, like I would what agree you with that assessment uh i must also say that i'm going to be called away now and uh i do apologize um so I, I will join you next time and, and hopefully uh, we will ha have this 
pretty much ironed out. Hope so. Greg, I totally agree with what you said there about very stiff penalties for failure to register or failure to comply with the ordinance. And I also like the idea of lesser penalties for, or maybe even letters of warning for the first violation for mm -hmm. relatively minor issues. Yeah, we did have, um, I was looking at back through some of the comments, because I know that I remember there being one comment that had a pretty detailed um, penalty scale and somebody had written out and, and I can't remember, Commissioner Brown, you might have written something in too in one of your, uh, in one of your submittals, I go open up one of those as well. But the one I'm looking at right now sort of had this scale of first offense, written warning, second offense, $100 fine, third offense, $500 fine, fourth offense, 1,000 and suspension of permit for five days, fifth offense, 2,500, suspension for 30 days, sixth offense, 5,000, suspension for six months, seventh offense, 10,000, suspension for one year, and then an eighth offense would be a permanent ban uh, available as long as that person owns that property. Uh, and then it goes on to talk about um, failure to proper, you know, get proper permits um, and, and failure to follow life safety requirements would, re, would, would um, result in loss of the ability to get permits as well. And that's pretty deep. Yeah, you're a good side, Tom. Right. <laughs> I did not uh, provide that one. No, that one is definitely not yours, no. Um, <laughs> yeah, that, that came back from the public input. And yes. Mm -hmm. uh, let me see here. I, it, it came from the, um, the owner of the Heritage Distilling Company. <laughs> Jason or Jeremy, I think his name was, I can't recall. Right, 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 right. yeah. <laughs> Justin. I liked it. I thought it was great. <laughs> I like the escalating scale of fines, but I'm not sure I'd want to wait till the eighth violation to uh, permanently suspend their right to do this. I think I'd probably uh, do that at a lower level. Like five. Yeah. And and even those, those numbers sound big. Um, I, I will tell you again, just as to give you an example, um, that home I was talking about at the spit, there are actually two homes on that property and each one of them rents for $1,000 a night. So, um, and, and then, so anyway, 8,000, 10,000 sounds like a lot of money. But when you're pulling in, you know, potentially $30,000 uh, a month, you know, maybe not. So I, I agree with your point is I agree with, with you, John, that that eight is too many before it's banned. Commissioner Soltis. I was going to suggest that maybe Carl and Jeremy think about maybe providing a few examples for each of the two generic categories we're talking about, you know, like the major problem areas as well as the, you know, like business license, no business license or whatever, health and safety. And then the minor ones like noise, parking. So we kind of have sort of a scorecard to, to ping against uh, as we go forward. Yeah, I like that idea. Let's use our expertise. Let's put Jeremy to work. Right. Jeremy, did you get that? <laughs> <laughs> He's already working. I did. Okay, good. I saw you, saw you right in there. Um, I'm looking at uh, one of Commissioner Brown's submissions here now, um, and he has some examples of 500 for a first offense, 750 for a second offense, and 1,200 for a third. Um, what kind of offenses were you thinking of, Tom, for those? Those came from uh, actual ordinances. I. I without going back and reconstructing, and I can't tell you what the, the towns were, but they were for, uh, I think, broadly uh, violations of the, uh, the, the ordinance, uh, whether they were noise parking or whatever. And, you know, and 
you know, I, I think all this, all of this, the, the size, the size of the penalty, and I, I agree with Greg on this, is is the deterrent. You know, these things are hard to enforce, uh, but but having those numbers in the ordinance as potential penalties, that's what's going to do the trick. You know. Okay, so um, are you comfortable then, Tom, uh, you th uh, with Bob's suggestion of letting Carl and Jeremy, you know, put some stuff together for us? Yes, yes, okay. I am. Yeah. Okay. We okay. we will do that. Um, I'll just say further staff research. But I'll, I'll go along with the idea of, you know, stiff fines for the important ones. I, I, I like that idea for sure. Okay. Further staff research, maybe. Scale. Okay. Um, all right. We have two left here. We've got the parking here. Uh, in what zones should short term rentals be allowed? So, this is something that we haven't really discussed very much. And um, and I don't know uh, if if commissioners have considered it very much either. I'm trying to think. I'm trying to think back to your submittals, and I I don't think I recall it ever really being broached much. I know uh, the Gig Harbor Short Term Rental Alliance touched on it. Uh, I think we had a few other commenters who touched on on it. Um, what we provided to you is just you know what we do with currently with lodging level one and how that is, um, where that is allowed and where it isn't allowed. Um, and I do have a table here that shows all three of our lodging uses that I can bring up on the screen as well. That might be helpful to take a look at. Uh, let's see, there we go. Carl, could you explain what lodging level one is? The lodging level one was essentially yeah. created for uh, uh, for bed and breakfasts. Oh, okay. So it's it's defined as a single family home that provides um, not more than five guest rooms uh, and may provide meals. So we have lodging level one, lodging level two, and lodging level three. Um, and lodging level two is essentially like a motel. So you can walk directly into the room and lodging level three is essentially a hotel where you actually have to go inside a building and then to your room. Okay. So this table here sort of shows um, what this, these are the zones across the top. Uh, and then we've broken it out. We, you know, in our code, we use CUP and um, dashes for not allowed. We use CUP for conditional use and we use permitted um, for those uses that are just permitted outright. So for lodging level one, for instance, we permit it and generally allow it uh, in most residential zones. So it's a conditional use in an R1 zone, which is just our regular single family residential zone. That's you know most what we have most of in the city. Um, and then we, it's a conditional use in our R2 zoning. Um, and then it's a permitted use outright in the R3, which is a multi, more of a multiple multifamily residential zone. And then we permit it through our RB1 through DB and B1. So those are sort of commercial zones. We have kind of hybrid residential and commercial. Downtown business is all commercial. 
B1, it's mostly commercial. The general business zone is meant to be largely commercial as well. Um, and we, but it's a conditional use there. Commercial, it's a conditional use. Uh, we don't allow it in, you know, employment district. We don't allow it in the public institutional. Um, and it's not allowed for some reason. They didn't allow it in these planned community planned community um, zones either. And then it's a conditional use in all of our waterfront zones. So Carl, do you have a recommendation based on all of our discussions so far? Because I'm, I'm kind of thinking that one way or another, we're gonna have a new category here that's specifically called STR. Yeah, and again, I kind of come back to the fact that these are generally speaking, a lot like, an, like a bed and breakfast, uh, even though a bed and breakfast, like we've said, is a little bit more uh, the use is maybe a little bit more intense uh, because it's you know year round and they have may have five guest bedrooms. Uh, they have a requirement for more parking. Um, but I would say generally speaking, the uses are very are are very similar. And so I think it the it would it would follow along with this how we permit and where we permit lodging level ones pretty, pretty closely. Now we've decided we've, we've decided we won't use a conditional use permit for right. short-term rental. So rather than conditional use, these would say permitted use wherever it says conditional use. Now, now the, the, um, would that be permitted with conditions or and um, as the Alliance had suggested in which I think seems like a good idea to me, or is our ordinance, I, I, as I read through their suggested conditions, we've kind of covered the waterfront, so to speak, <laughs> on, on uh, what they had suggested to be in the conditions and, and I forget the other term that they used. Um, yeah, we well, we would use the um, we would use a footer, a footnote like they're using there, and we uh, do have we do have footnotes in our uh, use table. Um, maybe maybe it'd be useful for me to pull that up the use table for you to see. Let me stop sharing this for a second. But what we would do is we would use a we would use a footnote that would say that the 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 provisions of this new code that this new ordinance that we're writing right now would apply to those to those uses so then you would look at it if it's allowed in that zone as a planner we would look at it see that it's allowed in that zone and then we would go out to the short-term rental code and we would administer that code against their proposal all right commissioner soltis uh, i think that uh I'm sorry, my, that's a residual hand, Carl. Can I oh, back I off on it? Sorry, my my bad. So yeah, I think the, the Gig Harbor Short Term Rental Alliance. That's kind of what they're doing. I think they even listed it as as uh, number thirty two. I think we have currently thirty one footnotes under our use table right now. So that's about right. We would have a footnote thirty two that would say go see this ordinance and that's and apply those regulations to this use. Yeah, okay. Well, it seems that that with everything we've discussed that it kind of would almost just be plug and play. We've decided it's permitted, not conditional use permit. And, and it should be pretty self-explanatory with all the other things we've talked about that are going into the ordinance about you know, where it would be permitted. That, I think that that's kind of my thinking too, Chair. I, don't, I think that if we followed along with where lodging level one is currently allowed and change those to permitted versus conditional use, that 
we would be uh, we'd be we'd be capturing uh, we'd be capturing it exactly where where we would want it. Would it make sense to split level one into a, a 1A and a 1B and 1B stays to be the bed and breakfast ones that you, you just described that are there and 1A becomes everything changes from conditional to permitted in the residential areas? Because um, we're talking about two different categories now. Carl, so pain. Sorry, so I, well, I was just thinking, so you're saying that instead of short-term rental, we would have a lodging level one, which would, A, which would be uh, bed and breakfast and a lodging level one B, which would be short-term rental? That's a thought. I mean, uh, we're splitting level one into two things anyway, I think, by adding short-term rentals as a standalone. Yeah, you know, that makes sense. That is something I think Jeremy and I kind of we we we've, we've had some discussions about that, you know, as we've talked about this more and kind of tried to suss it out, you know. Yes. It's, it's like we're redefining lodging level one in some manner, and you know, we already have some provision in the code for it. Go ahead, Jeremy. I think before we had spoke about all these options, including renaming all of them, but. Uh... Uh, I think if I was to do it, I would just say uh, lodging, short-term rental, and then and then separate it out that way. So, but I mean, it's just a matter of what you want to call it. I think. Well, I, I tend to agree with that, and and this is why because the um, you know this is be a, a phenomenon that grew out of people like figured out they could make money by renting out their bedroom. Um, and, and it was, you know, at the beginning, it was pretty much always owner occupied. And, and so it was, um, that is, so it was never at the, at the beginning of it, people's intent to do anything other than that. Um, and so over the course of time, the whole Airbnb short term rental concept has changed. Whereas all, the whole city's descriptions of lodging levels in my mind, looking at them, reading them, and understanding the history, those things were created as businesses. They, they needed business licenses. That's you know there was it, it described the, the different kinds of business lodging in there, and and I'd be in favor therefore of leaving all of those descriptions as they are and 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 adding on this step this new thing called short term rentals. I think I think it works. I think it works either way. You know, uh, it maybe is it's maybe in some ways cleaner to have a new term, a new short term rental term used in the code, because I think, you know, if we're start if we're if we're not creating a new we're not creating a lodging ordinance. If we were creating a whole new chapter that was dealing with lodging and it included lodging level one, two, three. Uh, and short-term rentals within that, then that might make sense to have sort of subcategories of those lodging levels that we already have. But we're creating an ordinance that's called short-term rental. Um, so it's a sort of a separate thing, even though it's going to fall under the lodging uses in some in some ways. Well, and if you call it short-term rentals, then for somebody who's thinking of doing this, it's easier to find it. It's easier to understand it because it's the words are right out there. Yeah. I, I think that's important because, you know, people complain about the, the process of applying and confusion and everything else. So let's make it clear the difference. I think a standalone, however you do it, Carl, is fine. I mean, it, it, it clean, clean it up, clear it up as best you can. And you know, whether it's 1A, 1B, or a standalone short-term rental, just so like Shannon makes a great point. I mean, I don't think level one, two, and three doesn't mean anything to the lay person who looks at it. You have to go down, well, oh, bed and breakfast, is that's level one. Oh, it's a motel or a hotel. I don't know why they didn't do that in the first place. There's probably some good reason. 
but it, it does add a level of confusion for the person that's trying to look up what's my conditions for this particular use. Well, and, and we did have that. I mean, they, they did make a change to lodging level one, two, and three. I mean, we did have uh, bed and breakfast and hotel motel in the code. They, they, and there might have been some other uses too. And I think they were trying to consolidate them, you know, to try and craft definitions that would capture different sorts and types of uses under these three categories. And and that's kind of where we landed with short-term rentals. When these first started coming around, people wanted to permit them. We're thinking, well, we have to look at one of these three and we have to put it under one of them. And so we put it in lodging level one. It's the closest definition to it, but it's not perfect. No good you know, deed if, goes unpunished. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. What if you put in the definition something like, you know, a parenthetic comment, you know, short-term rentals, um, you know, commonly referred to as Airbnbs, um, you know, and then continue on with, with, and, and other names, or you, you could add in some things um, just so people get, get the idea of, you know, what, what is meant by this, you know, short-term rental, because that's what people think of. Yeah. Um, it's like, nobody talks about well, most people don't say, I'm going to, can you hand me a tissue? They say, hand me a Kleenex. Yeah. <laughs> That's a very American thing though, right? If you go yeah. other places, right. you know, they don't call a Q-tip a Q-tip, you know? Yeah. Well, and if we're requiring the third party, you know, the third party, what am I trying to say? The third party Flat handles out. those kind of things like Airbnb and so, so that would be natural that those things would be defined, I would think. Except the only, the only, I would just push back just a little bit because they are businesses and businesses go away. They go under. Oh, you know, yeah. Airbnb might not be Airbnb, might get bought by VRBO and then we don't have Airbnb anymore. They might. Yeah, all out by, <laughs> there's, by, uh, there's already been several mergers within the uh, yeah. different platforms. So. Yeah, it could quickly be out of date. Elon yeah. Musk might buy the whole <laughs> gamut of them, you know, before the end of the year. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I appreciate that, though. I mean, I think it's and I think that's something, you know, something that comes along with this probably is a client assistance memo that we would put together. And in that client assistance memo, I think it would be wholly appropriate to um, list some of ex those examples. You know, here's. Yeah. And, and the platforms that we're sort of expecting as, as examples, you know, when we say they have, to, they have to tell us what platform they're advertising on, here are some examples of what those platforms are. I think that would, I think that would be a good and appropriate place to, to say that. Okay, yeah, good point. So Chair, back to zoning then, are we comfortable? Uh, you're, it sounds like it sounds like the commission is is comfortable with uh, staff moving forward with kind of what I described and sort of mirroring lodging level one, um, and we'll do a little more critical thinking about it and make sure that we don't can't think of any reason why it should be allowed in one and maybe not another because yeah. of the difference in STR and lodging level one, and we we will make that recommendation in the ordinance. Okay. Yeah, I, I like that idea. Okay. All right, back to the table here. Zoom webinar. Okay. So finally, item number eighteen. Yes. The good neighbor, the good neighbor policy, should the good neighbor policy uh, be required to be posted on site uh, in a conspicuous location? Conspicuous? I think that's right. Yeah. Carl, I, I would say yes, uh, and I would also add one addition to that, and that is that uh, the good neighbor policy should also be provided to the adjoining neighbors. So that they understand what's being expected of the guests. Okay. 
Who will write that policy? I think we would cod I think we would codify it, Chair. I think we put it right in the code. These are the things that must be in the good neighbor policy. Okay. I think there are some out there. I've, I've uh, uh, yeah. seen yeah. references to them. So I suspect you could probably just uh, pirate something from one of the other cities. Yeah, good idea. Yeah, and I and I think uh, a lot of the sub submissions that we received from commissioners and and also comments that we received from the public have some uh, some good ideas in them as well um, that we could we could propose in that good neighbor policy. But I you know I don't I I think it's fairly clear what it looks like. But if there's anything that planning that the commissioners feel should absolutely not be missed. Um, I can add, you know, we can we can talk about those now. Carl, do we have anything uh, mm -hmm. that we've discussed that says that uh, events such as weddings, uh, fraternity parties, those kinds of things are prohibited? Yes, we do. I, I think, and I think that was in the draft ordinance or um, in the draft ordinance that Commissioner Brown had put out. And I think also in the one that staff had put together for that original meeting. Uh, I think we had some language in there about, about that as well. Uh, but yeah, that's definitely something that should be in that, I would think would be in that good neighbor policy. The Alliance mentioned it too. The Alliance, yeah, I think that's right. They did have it in theirs as well. I think that's one that everybody kind of agrees on that they shouldn't be holding any events. Events for hire or commercial functions are prohibited. That's how the Gig Harbor Alliance put it. It needs to be more than that. Yeah, I agree. Okay, and um, anybody else have other things that, that um, they think are missing? Are you talking in general, Greg, or uh, specific to good neighbor policy? In general. Okay. I had uh, a couple of other things. Uh, some of the cities required that the permit number that the city issues should be included in every advertisement that's that's made. Uh, we may be able to, we may not need that if we're going to require that everything be done through a platform, but that is something that uh, I did pick up from some of the other cities requirements. And then another thing uh, that some of the other cities had was they require that a log book be kept of every visitor. So those were the other two things that I wanted to add. Those would that are those log books are kept in the in the unit or they're kept by the manager owner or owner in this case or by since it's third party platform, will it all be computerized anyway? Well, yeah, you may not need it if it's if it's if the uh, third party platform already has that information. So uh, that may make it redundant. But uh, there were just a couple of things that some other cities had that I thought were good ideas. Yeah, yeah, agreed. Hey, Jeremy, really quick in your research there. Jeremy did a little bit of research on what kind of information we could get from those platforms. Mm -hmm. Is that is that something that we can get from them as far as who who rented and when? Uh, well, what what value does that information have for us? I I think the probably one one area that I thought of is that if there's a major incident that uh, people become aware of later on that maybe law enforcement needs to take uh, take that information from, uh, that would be available. Yeah, I believe that would be available anyway to law enforcement. Um, I know there's, through Airbnb, there is a city portal that they have where the city can access uh, things like the listings, how often they're being rented, uh, costs, things like that. Um, I don't know about the other platforms. 
I'm actually waiting on a call from somebody from Airbnb about setting that up for us. Uh, so hopefully that their platforms have something like that as well that I can get access to. Okay, maybe we could say then that if it's if the data is kept by the platform, uh, it wouldn't be necessary to keep a logbook. However, if the platform doesn't have it, then the logbook would be required. Yeah. Wonder if, I wonder if part of that came from uh, COVID and the need to do <laughs> contact tracing. It might have been that's what they were thinking of, yes. <laughs> okay, other things? Go ahead, uh, Bob. Um, two things. Uh, I wanted to circle back a little bit to the um, uh, discussion we had about the limit to the number of people that could be there if it was a single family rental. And Carl alluded to there's there's building code out there that says there's certain limitations depending upon the number of bathrooms. I thought perhaps it might make sense if <clears throat> that number was included in um, the condition of use somehow so that or we do some kind of maximum number that's in our minds more as reasonable as sort of counting bathrooms it's kind of that's a little obscure maybe i mean over time things change and and i'm not sure how, how close the city keeps track of that but if there was like a determination by the city official that this house is sized to fit 12 people that'd be great to have that in there or if that's too many people in our in our minds for a short term rental, maybe we set a number that's lower than that, like eight maximum of eight adults. Uh, I, I don't want to overturn the apple cart, Greg, but I just think that we want to be clear if there's a way to be clear about a number from the city perspective based on building code. That number would be useful, I think. Um, and the, the last thing, it's kind of, uh, we haven't talked about it yet, but in terms of the application itself, and this is probably Michelle's bailiwick, uh, I'm not quite sure all the things that we, that the, we want these STR owners to do. do. Do they need to get a business license? And then they, they also need to get a city, a city application that's put in, and, there, and is there an inspection fee that goes along with that? I don't understand exactly that. And I'm, Michelle probably told you, tried to tell me once or twice, but maybe you could review it one more time for us because I'd like to kind of get a sense of that application process and all the things they need to do. They do get a city, apply through it for a city business license when they get their state license and depend, and that's, it's $40 for the city business license. I don't know how much it is for the state license. And then each department does review it to make sure that the proper ERUs are being paid for water sewer hookups. Um, if inspection is required, then building goes out and does the inspection for the business license before he signs off on it to make sure there's um, adequate access and smoke and carbon monoxide detectors. Is there a Why charge for that too? No, that's included in the business license fee. Okay. And that's Thanks only for... 40 bucks? Yeah. Good grief. That wouldn't Not all businesses need wages. inspections. <laughs> Wow. When was the last time they updated the business license fee in Gig Harbor? <laughs> Three years ago, but a lot of businesses, they get a tenant improvement and through the building permit process and that's, there's an inspection there. So they're making up the fees. With the short-term rentals, there wasn't really a way to charge those fees because it's not on our fee sheet. Well, the, the, the Alliance suggested not, not only having a, a business license, but also a requirement to have a sh specifically to have a short term rental license. Yeah. And, and I'm in favor of that for a couple of reasons. One is to help, you know, fund the enforcement um, and the inspections and those sorts of things. And, and secondly, it will be easier to track, um, you know, who's to have a list that's not buried somewhere in the business license you know, list that's got to be hundreds. Yeah, and we do have ways to pull out certain businesses from our list with the um, permitting software we have now. So you can pull up just the lodging level ones, just the lodging level twos, but there is a way to track 
the business licenses that way as well, but we could put an endorsement on the business license for a short-term rental and have a fee associated with that. Well, remember that we will have a short-term rental permit as well as a type two permit. So, but prior to getting a business license, they're gonna to have to go through and get, get their entitlement through the city. So, you know, they'll actually be issued an approved an administrative approval as a type two permit, be an administrative approval that will have been uh, reviewed and vetted by the planning department, the building department and, um, and engineering. And then as a condition of that, they would, they would need to get their business license approved. Okay. Well, my thought would be that we need to um, capture some funding to, because we're gonna be doing some enforcement. We're gonna be spending some money on enforcement here. And I, I don't know if they you want the short-term rentals to pay a part of the enforcement job. Um, $40 is not gonna really be a significant amount of money towards that problem. Otherwise it comes from the general city, city revenues. And that's not fair really to the rest of the citizens. Well, it's, it's, kind, of, it's kind of not fair. They're paying for somebody else's enforcement of a short-term rental license that makes somebody else money, not them. Yep, good point. It may be something to think about, Greg, well, as we finish this discussion. Yeah. The right fee structure. I think that's a good point. John? Yeah, I think early in our discussion, we talked about the possibility of having adding a 2% uh, enforcement fee to the, um, what's the word, the hotel motel tax or, or as a separate fee, actually, uh, that would pay, help pay for the costs of enforcement but I think it would also be appropriate to charge a fee at the initial time of application. Yeah, I'd sort of forgotten you brought up that additional 2% <clears throat> because that would just be passed through, I'm sure from the owners to the guests. Um, right. And uh, so I'd be in favor of something like that, even perhaps more than 2%. <clears throat> yeah, whatever's appropriate. The, and then the two percent would be. Uh, when would that be charged? I'm sorry. That would be charged each guest uh, when they stay. So if you're paying, let's say the hotel motel tax is five percent, then on top of that there would be an additional two percent uh, enforcement fee or three percent or whatever the appropriate percentage would be. We had also discussed along the way and, and um, uh, minimal insurance coverage, um, especially if the city is doing inspections of, of the short-term rental properties. Um, it, it seems we would have an interest there for in make, ensuring they're insured. And the, the common number that, that um, everywhere that I read that had that requirement, the number was a million dollars minimum. I think that's a good idea. Same here. One other thing we might also do is ask them to name the city as also insured. That's what we do for special use permits and special event permits. And that's an easy thing to add to the application requirements. Good. Everybody good with that? Yes. Okay. Uh, and, and the other thing that had been brought up was that, and um, is that STRs would not be allowed in any tax exempt dwelling or in any government subsidized housing or in any tiny home developments. And um, I don't know if y'all agree with that, but 
you know, that was kind of thrown out there and I, we don't, I don't know that we came to a conclusion or I haven't seen it in the table. Yeah, Greg, I saw that in my notes and uh, I think that's appropriate. Yeah, that's now, a good philosophy. Greg, would, would that include uh, developments like uh, the Rosedale Estates or whatever it is where it's a rental place for seniors and they they got a court decision by which they evaded uh, paying any uh, school school tax basically uh, with their permit. They, they saved like 400,000 uh, bucks by claiming that there, were, there weren't going to be any children there, so they should not have to make any contribution to the, uh, the school district. Is, is, would that be included? Is that one of the targets that you have in mind? Correct. Okay. Chair, can you say it one more time? So not allowed in tiny homes, government subsidized housing. And what was the other? It was another category there, I believe. In the tax exempt dwelling. And uh, it's not it's not just those senior homes, but there's a number of different homes for various reasons qualify for, you know, real estate tax exemptions and, you know, so on school tax exemptions. Um, it, it just doesn't feel right to me that um, they should be able to have STRs in their home uh, if they're having those benefits already. Yeah. I agree with that, Greg. I'm good with that. I am too. Okay. And, oh, there it is. The term I couldn't remember that the, <laughs> The Alliance shoes conditions and performance standards. That, that was the second half of it that I could remember. So I had it at the bottom of my list. So we already talked about that. So that's the end of my list. So we might be done tonight. There, there, there's, a, there's, another, there's another subject that I think is important. And that is, I'd like to get a better understanding of the timeline from here on out whether there's going to be any more uh, public comment, uh, how this is going to be presented to the council, et cetera, whether the council iterates on it and comes back with questions or suggestions or whatever. I, I don't understand it, and I think it's important. Yeah, I'm sure Carl can run through that for us. Good point. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So where, where we're at now, still study sessions, um, but there, there's a requirement for the planning commission then to hold a, a public hearing. Um, so once we're once we're to a point, and I'm I'm kind of hoping that we're getting close to a point where we may be able to hold a public hearing on May 19th. Um, I guess that that depends on whether or not we can pull a, a draft ordinance together for you all to review by next Thursday, which is starting to sound really ambitious at the moment. Uh, but Carl, uh, let, let me just let me just ask Carl. Sure. Would, would we publish anything prior to the public hearing so that the public can have a sense of what we have in mind? Yes. Yeah, we're required to do that. So we'd have to we have to post um, a notice prior to the public hearing, uh, Michelle, two weeks before the public hearing, and we have to have the um, the materials published and out to the um, public one week prior to the public hearing. If I'm not um, minimum of ten days, a maximum of thirty days. But I usually try to do two weeks because that's that's what we generally, by rule of thumb, we notice fourteen days prior to hearings. And that material would be a draft ordinance. Yes. Thank you. And then from there, Commissioner Brown, uh, once we hold the hearing, then uh, the Planning Commission would deliberate um, either that same evening, uh, while there would be deliberations that same evening, and then whether or not the Commission chose to make a recommendation to move that, uh, move those draft regulations forward could happen that same night, or it could come back for another meeting. Um, if there's substantial changes made to the regulations or ordinance, we may decide we need another public hearing for planning commission. That's possible. It doesn't happen very often. 
Um, at any rate, then it does go to um, city council. The city council has uh, would would have a first reading of the ordinance uh, and a public hearing of their own. Uh, so people would also the public would also have a chance to weigh in at that point, and then there would be um, at least a second reading of the ordinance at at council. If council makes substantial changes to um, to the ordinance, um, then it can be it can it could come back to planning commission for further study and. Um, and well, another recommendation. So that's, you know, it's very possible that it, that it comes back to planning commission if it doesn't make it through. Because this is a complicated subject and because we've all done a lot of research and it also had a lot of, I think, very constructive discussion of all of these issues. I think it's very important that we present it to the council uh, with a uh, an executive summary, with a uh, kind of an explanation of all of the things we've considered, so that they don't get tangled up in uh, issues that are appropriate for uh, Joshua Tree, uh, California, but don't really have much to do with Gig Harbor, and so that there aren't a lot of uh, questions from people who haven't spent as much time uh, considering this. Uh, in other words, if, if feed them as much background as we can with the draft ordinance. Is it, did I make that clear? Yeah, I understand what you're saying, Commissioner Brown, and I agree. And, and everything, all the work that's been done so far uh, is in, will be in the record. Um, and for for something like this, I mean, oftentimes with our ordinance, we will, of course, there will be a recommendation provided uh, from the planning commission uh, as well. Uh, and that I think usually acts as kind of the, um, the executive summary of the work that had been done. And we can make that as, you know, we could make that more detailed in this case, if need be. And I think we probably would because you're right, it is such a complicated issue. Um, and we would also have, you know, there's a, there's an agenda bill that staff writes, uh, and sometimes we include a staff report too, uh, to, to accompany the ordinance. Many times we just use the agenda bill as the staff report. It just kind of depends on the, the nature, the, the, the content of, you know, what we're trying to, um, explain to council. And, you know, maybe in a case like this, where it is so complicated, you know, a staff report might make a full-blown staff report might make more sense. It would be important to me to have a chance to review all of those documents uh, before they go to uh, go forward as uh, products of the of the planning commission. Okay, any other discussion? Yeah, Greg, just, just one thing. I am not available on the second meeting in May. I, I don't think that's any reason to change the public hearing, but uh, I just wanted to make sure everybody was aware of that. Okay. And, and that's still very tentative. Uh, so just, just for the record, we don't have a, a public hearing scheduled for the 19th at this point. Okay. All right. Well, uh, thank you all for your work. Uh, thank you all to the members of the public that have attended. Um, and we will look forward to seeing what you put together for us, Jeremy and Carl. And I'm sure Michelle will be involved with that as well. And uh, uh, next business is already been described. So we'll just wait to hear from you then, Carl, right? Yes, Chair. Um, so the, the plan then uh, would be that we'll, we're, gonna, we're going to craft a, a draft ordinance um, to bring back for your consideration, um, well, just for your reaction, really, uh, sort of a first pass uh, next Thursday. 
that's 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 the goal. Um, but because we had this special meeting in between, we're probably not able to get that draft out until I think at the earliest would be Monday. Um, and so that would be that'll be the goal to get it out by the end of the day on Monday. Uh, and then we'll have a study session on the fifth. Um, if any any changes uh, need to be made, uh, we can make those changes then uh, prior to, we'll know at that point if we're ready for hearing on the 19th. Okay. Again, cutting it pretty close all, all the way around. <laughs> all right, TBD. Yeah. And just uh, just to clarify, I mean, what what the, the question you asked, uh, Commissioner Brown is, I mean, this is what you're asking for is is how we've been functioning all along in the in the planning commission. The the every time something is sent to the council, a cover letter from the from the chair of the planning commission goes to uh, uh, the council um, with the communication, and and that involves a back and forth between the staff and I. And um, and so that is you know that is the process. And so um, to bring all of that back to um, to the whole planning commission uh, to review and discuss would be additional time and additional step that historically we haven't done before. But it doesn't mean we can't if that's what um, if that's what everybody wants to do. I'm more interested in seeing Carl's report. <laughs> I mean, it, as executive summary notes go, Greg, as chairperson, you know, it's 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 high level. We've studied this very hard, and you know, it's really key things in here. We, where probably the meat of the matter is, is in Carl's memo. I mean, the staff memo. That's where probably the the, the deep stuff is, but. I mean, we've been working with Carl on his memos and this input for quite a while now. There's a there's a point we got to kind of trust your staff to to do the right thing, and he they do the right thing. So I think we're we'd be okay. But you know, Tom's Tom's got some concerns about you know getting the right message to the council. I I guess I have confidence that that staff will take care of that. That's just me. John or Shannon? Yeah, I'm willing to trust staff on that. Uh, I, I uh, agreed with what Tom said that this is very important, but I think staff's done a really good job, certainly up to this point, and I uh, don't see any reason to think that they wouldn't continue to do the same. Well, and I was going to say, it's not only staff. I mean, Greg is also involved. And so, you know, if he sees anything that he feels is, is you know, out of what we all have done all this time, I would think he, he would catch that or note that or in his conversations with the planning staff. Correct? Yeah. And in fact, the last one that we sent forward, you know, we did have... Um, Carl presented something and I said, you know what, I think it's better for you to put uh, kind of exactly what Tom's referring to, more explanation right up front because if I'm at the city council reading this memo, I, I'd be, I'd have a whole bunch of questions and then I'd get to the, 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 the end of the second page of the cover letter and say, oh, there it is. But the whole time I would have been thinking, you know, what about, what about, what about, what about? So, you know, I worked with Carl and his staff and, and you know, did some wordsmithing and and I think we came up with a with an excellent product. So you're correct. That's how it's been happening. So I'm I'm comfortable with that happening the way it it always has.
Okay. All right, folks. Well, um, sounds like uh, we've we're looking forward to a, a draft ordinance and barring any other discussion, I'm willing to uh, open the floor to entertain a motion to adjourn the meeting. So moved. Second. I second. Uh, any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Okay, motion passes unanimously. Carl, could you hang around for just a second, please? For sure. And Michelle, obviously. 